the foyer. Go ahead and come on in. We're going to begin worship today. How's everybody doing? Come on, raise your hands if you're doing good this morning. Raise your hands if you're glad to be in this place today. Well, hey, if you're new with us today, we want to say welcome. We're so glad that you'll be here with us in our service. We feel that God is going to have a, a blessing, a special blessing for you today if you're a visitor. Um, hey, look, we don't make any any uh, we don't make anything about it. We're here to worship the Lord. That's our sole purpose this morning. We want to come together as a family, as a group of believers that just we pour out our praise upon Him. We give Him the glory that's due to His name, and then when we do that, we just watch Him work. We just watch Him do things in our service. So let me pray for us real quick. Father, we come before you today, Father, and we just surrender. Lord, we surrender our mind and our thoughts. Lord, some of us could have come into this room today with heavy hearts and something's on our mind today, something that maybe happened this morning earlier, something that happened this weekend or last week. But Lord, we just surrender it to you now. Lord, we clear out our mind. God, we put our focus and our gaze on you today, Father. Lord, we look to you this morning, God. Lord, we worship you. We give you honor in this place, God. We give you honor in this place. You're the only one that's worthy. Lord, we love you in this place. Amen? Come on, let's have fun today. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Help me sing this out. I live in the mountains that I face. Be stronger than the power of. Sing that again. Higher than the mountain. Higher than the mountains that I face. Any stronger than the power of the grave. And he's constant in the trial and the change of this one thing remains this one thing remains every voice your love never fails and never gives up come on and runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me your love and on and on and on and on it goes for it overwhelms and satisfies my soul yet I never to be afraid and this one thing remains this one thing remains your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me Hallelujah. Oh, Father, we're going to have fun to you. We're going to have fun today in this place, Father, singing our songs to you. Come on, let's sing on and on. 
and on and on and on and on it goes. And it overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never ever have to be afraid of this one thing. We're going to let give you praise in this place. Father, we thank you that our hope is secure in you, Lord. God, we thank you, God, that today, or no matter what we walked into this place with, God, our hope is in you, Jesus. Our hope is in you, Father, today. 
Oh, come and move in this place, God. Come and have your way in the hearts of your people today. Oh, we want to encounter your presence today, God. Yes, Lord. This came that shakes the mountain tops. The only word that breaks the curse. Yeah, sing it out. Come on. Your name and the colors of is higher than the others, higher than the others. This name that shakes the mountain tops. Every voice. The only word that breaks the curse yeah. is love. Come on, even louder. Your Good church, lift it up.
Just lift up his name right now, church. Lift up the name of Jesus right there in your own heart. Name above all names, name above all names, Jesus. Oh, we lift up your name today, Jesus. Our victory is in you, Jesus. Our victory is in you, Jesus. Oh, my hope is in you. Love you, Lord. Oh, Come on and give him, give him the praise that's due to his name right now, church. Just right there where you're at in your own heart. Come on, just begin to worship him right now. Oh, the victory is yours, Jesus. Oh, the victory is yours. Oh, the victory is yours. Sing that out again. There is power. power Come on, church. Come on and lift it up. This morning, lift it up with all that you are. power in your name father the word says he is a strong tower and the righteous run into it. worthy 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 are you father oh you're a strong tower that we run into this morning lord i just believe that right now that if there's someone that's walked into this place this morning with something heavy on your heart, 
a situation at your job, a situation in your marriage, a situation with one of your children. The word says that he is a strong tower and the righteous run into it. And as we worship this morning, and as we lift up the name of Jesus, that's a righteous act. You are acting in a righteous manner than when you are worship and you sing his name. So you can begin to run into that tower this morning right now, church. today oh we run into that strong tower Lord
raised our voices, Jesus enthroned. Jesus enthroned upon the praises of our Oh, Jesus, you're the king, you're the center of the Lord. Sing that again, Jesus. Jesus, enthroned upon the praises of our hearts. Oh, Jesus. You're the king and you're the center of it all. Can we do it one more time? Even louder, Jesus enthroned. Jesus. Come on, you sing it. Enthroned upon the praises of the You sound beautiful, church. Oh, Jesus. Even in this moment now, God, we just clear our mind. Lord, we fix our eyes upon you. Lord, we focus on you now. Lord, in this season, in our community, in our family, in our nation, now more than ever, God, Lord, we fix our eyes on the true and living God. Lord, the world would try to come and would try to show us other gods, other idols, other things that would try to take our focus and take our attention. But Lord, in this moment, we fix our eyes on the one true God, the one that is living and breathing in our midst, the one that's presence descends and dwells among his people. Oh, beloved, our prayer every night of the week and especially on Sunday morning is that God's presence would be felt in such a strong and tangible measure in this place. That you would want for nothing else but more of his presence. That you would find yourself when you leave this place hungering and thirsting for more of his presence. This is just our Sunday morning gathering. This is where two or more are gathered and his presence comes, but we pray that his presence follows you and that your family and your friends, they sense it on you and around you and over you. And so, Lord, this morning as we sing and as we worship, Lord, God, fix our eyes. God, allow us, Lord, to not be distracted, Lord, in this time, but that our eyes would be fixed. And I pray, God, that you would give us ears to hear your voice. Lord, in this season, ears to hear your voice, God. Oh, lead us, Father. And we'll worship you, Lord. And we'll turn it back to praise. Lord, we'll let the testimony, God, We'll let the testimony of our lives, God, turn it back into praise. Jesus, we worship you. Let's sing it one more time. Jesus enthroned. Jesus enthroned upon the praises of our heart. Oh, Jesus, you're the king and you're the center of it all. Oh, 
Oh, don't lose focus. Sing it to him, Jesus. Jesus, enthroned upon the praises of our hearts. Oh, Jesus, you're my king and you're the center of it all. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Do you realize how much power there is in the name of Jesus? What is it in your life right now or in your circumstance that you're like, man, I don't know what, what is going to Maybe you need to invite Jesus into that circumstance. Because at the name of Jesus, the enemy goes, I'm out of here. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be around that because that is reflective of who lives within each one of us who are his sons and daughters. Jesus. I love every song we sang this morning has done nothing but talk about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Father, right now, there's someone in this room that desperately needs to experience the love to just that intimate touch of your presence Jesus Christ move in their life right now I don't know what it is what circumstance it is they're dealing with what they brought in with them that oh if I can't get beyond this if I don't get rid of this if this continues on I don't know what I'm gonna do well I tell you this is what you need to do you need to call out to Jesus and say Jesus I surrender this I put it into your hands and I'm going to step away from it and I'm going to begin to trust you and walk in faith. That's what faith is. But I don't see it. I, it hadn't happened yet. It hadn't come to pass. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Believing something is even when it isn't. God, bring us into a, an element of faith walk with you where we do not fear or shrink back but we press into you and we take you at your word and we know that Jesus you said I have given you all authority all authority and the peace that I give you I don't give like the world has I give you my peace and it's a peace that passes all understanding and so father right now I just pray for those that need a special touch of your presence in fact I'm gonna ask you to be bold enough if there's something that you need right now, a special touch, I just want to ask you to lift your hand up. God, I need, I need a special touch. Holy Spirit, right now, you see every one of these hands is raised up. You see the ones that aren't raised up, but they're raised up in their heart right now. God, let us be bold enough to say, Father, I need you. But God, I thank you that you desire to speak to every single person point of our needs and so I thank you in advance that you are moving in ways that maybe we cannot see that that are beyond our even our comprehension but God you know exactly what steps need to take place so Holy Spirit move bring your peace bring your comfort bring your love bring your presence in a way that maybe has never been experienced God, your word says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Father, we want a taste of you. We want to know that you have your love and you're pouring it into us. And it tastes good. You're a good, good father. And so, Father, I pray your blessings over each person who lifted their hands. I pray your blessings over every person in this room and everyone who's listening right now. That, God, you would move in such a supernatural way that it would be undoubting. They would go and say, only God could have done that. Only God could have brought that to pass. And we claim that in the name of Jesus. And we all said, amen, amen. Go ahead and be seated. Yeah. Wow. Let me just tell you, if we ever get tired of singing about or saying the name of Jesus, 
you better back up and you better get over in a corner and you better get alone with the Father and say, God, what's going on inside of me? Because God desires to draw us ever, ever closer to Him. And sometimes the way He draws us closer is through circumstances or situations that come our way. We didn't see it coming. We didn't realize it was coming. But it's right here in front of us. And God says, I want to be a part of that. I will walk with you through that. And I will bring amazing blessings in the midst of all of that. Because we know that all things work together for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Well, he's a good, good father. He just is. And I'm telling you, he wants to lavishly love us with his presence and his power. When now comes the time, we get to give back to the father. It's offering time. We give back, get to give back to him. Hey, you know what? We've gotten a little lax. It's offering time. Come on. We get to give back. We don't have to. There's nobody holding a gun to your head saying, man, you get that billfold out. Get that checkbook out. No, we cannot outgive the Father. And so when we practice stewardship and we honor him through our tithes and offerings, he says, watch and see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings upon you that you'll, finally, you'll find yourself going, all right, that's enough. Shut it off. And so... Let me pray for us, and we're going to take up our offering. We have buckets on the left side over here, my right, your left, and they're going to be passed across. And so some of y'all may have to move when you go to grab it, you know, in between the gaps. But, Father, thank you, thank you, thank you that you provide your provision. You are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. And you have everything that we need. You've provided everything that we need for life and godliness. And so when we give back this small portion to you, The way you extravagantly bless beyond, it's mind-boggling at times when we practice what you promised in your scripture. And so bless the givers, bless these gifts as we continue to do ministry within these walls and beyond these walls. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Here's the buckets. They're being passed across. If one gets past you, We have offering boxes at the back and out in the foyer. And I will say this. If you're a first-time guest, we so appreciate you being a part of our worship time today. And so there's a card in the seat back in front of you. If you'll take the time and fill that card out, you can bring it to our welcome center at the conclusion of our service. We got a special gift for you, and we're going to do two things with, with that card. We're going to give you a phone call and just say thank you. For being with us. And then we're going to send you a letter that says basically the same thing. Thank you. And so we are honored by your presence and for you being with us. Hey, I just have to say for those of our faith family that were a part of the community swap meet yesterday. It was amazing. People were bringing, brought all kinds of stuff. People would drive through and they'd go, okay, now how much is this? Nothing. You need it? Take it. In fact, I love it. Lamar... Avery brought his uh, appliance dolly to, to help us move some stuff around, and we were moving a stove, and he goes, hey, hold on, I got my appliance dolly, and he looked over, and he goes, my appliance dolly is no longer there. <laughs> yeah. Hey, nail it down or hide it, because if you didn't, it was gone. Yeah. And so, anyway, <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, all you can hear him was saying, Brenda. (laughs) No, but it was an awesome day, and so thank you. We're going to do something probably toward the end of uh, November with blankets and coats and any of that stuff that that doesn't get get taken, then we're going to take it and take it to the homeless downtown in, in, in Fort Worth. But right now, I want to call my beautiful bride up. She's going to make a couple of announcements before we get into the Word, all right? Come on, Debbie. <laughs> so I hear I did such a great job last week. It's now my new job. <laughs> I love it so much. A couple of things. Uh, how many of you have little ones like uh, bed babies up to four years old? Raise your hand. Okay, so if you see a number that happens to pop up over here and your child is in the child care facility back there, they need you, okay? So don't just ignore the number if you see your number, okay? (laughs) Don't think someone else is going to go see your child. Okay. 
Uh, aren't you excited about that, though? Isn't that awesome? You get to see a number. Okay. Uh, so, uh, along the lines of children, next Sunday, can we say next Sunday? child dedication okay if you've never had your child dedicated and you would like to do that uh, you need to see Sarah today and so she can get you the information that you need this is not just for little babies newborns this is for any child that has that you want to see dedicated and then we're also going to talk about what it means to dedicate then uh, night of worship is Sunday night as well so we have child dedication can we say night of, night of worship okay excellent next sunday night the trunk or treat is a interesting season for us because we normally have a alternative for people going to the neighborhood uh door to door we usually this is just like a game room that we open up for all of our kids in the neighborhood. And this year, since we are on restrictions, we're not gonna be able to do that. But we're gonna take the love of Jesus into our neighborhoods. I'm so excited about this. Can you say the love of Jesus? The love of Jesus. It needs to go to the neighborhood, okay? And we're gonna have information that we can hand out uh, about our church as well as whatever games that you have. And these are gonna go through life groups as well as if you want to do this with a group of your friends, you need to see Sarah. She has a sign-up table out in the foyer, and we need to have as many representations of TCAB in the neighborhoods, okay? So let's get this, okay? Y'all good with this? Yes. It's gonna be really, really fun, so take advantage of that. Last but not least, November is next month. Y'all know that? No. <laughs> Christmas is like two months away. Oh. We are gonna have a fabulous, fearless, and free women's conference. Ladies, you do not want to miss this. Super cheap, great, 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 uh, that we're gonna have a, a speaker, Christy Williams, it's gonna be awesome. T-shirts are 20, Terry. Yeah. Terry and I have been doing this conference for the last five years, and you do not want to miss this conference. It's, gonna, it's Holy Spirit led, and it's gonna be a lot of uh, things happening. It's um, T-shirts 20, conference is 35. $35. Who goes to a conference for $35 and get fed? No, nobody. Okay, so let's do that. Terry, uh, we'll have a group of ladies out at the, uh, we have a women's table. Huh. A women's table out in the foyer, so don't go out that door without stopping by the women's table and getting information, okay? Thank you. All right. One other thing, next Saturday morning from 9 to 11, we're going to have a men's breakfast. So guys, if you want to come up, I asked Bo why we were doing it so late. You know, I'm used to having breakfast around 7. And, uh, but anyway, 9 to 11, right here, we'll have a great time of fellowship. Biscuits, gravy, these guys cook really well. Uh, and so, guys, you don't want to miss that. If you have your Bibles, open them to Luke chapter 15. We are continuing. Last week, we started the parable of the, the prodigal son. And so... Uh, we're going to finish that parable, which is now we're going to talk about the elder son, the elder brother. Hey, and by the way, if you, I don't know, if, Debbie, if you mentioned this or not, because I, but if you see a little number pop up on the screen, like right, did you mention that? Did you? Okay. Hey, believe it or not, from back here, I, you know, sometimes it's like, wah, 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 you know? And so I'm just like, I'm nodding my head, and I know y'all are thinking like, man, he's really getting all this. I'm not hearing a thing, okay? So, but you did an excellent job on those announcements, though, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, I may need to get back up. Never, never mind. Uh, but the parable, son, the parable of the prodigal son is really a, a unique uh, story that Jesus is telling. It's right on the heels of really the first two verses of that chapter. Jesus is fellowshipping with what? Sinners and tax collectors. And the Pharisees are upset because he's hanging out. This man eats with sinners and tax collectors. And so he begins to tell these parables, these stories. And they're all focused about the love of the Father. The love the love of going after the lost sheep. 
the finding the lost coin and the love of the prodigal son, the father having for his son. But I want to read, starting with verse 25, I want to read to the end of this chapter. And then just, in fact, this morning is going to have a lot of questions that I'm going to pose to you. Because this is an amazing uh, parable that, that Jesus shares. In verse 25 it says, And meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Well, your brother's come home. And your father has killed a fatted calf. Because he is him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaying, slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, You kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he's found. One of the things, several things I want us to look at, but I want us to just for a moment just step back and think about the younger son. Last week when we looked at this, we have the story, the young son rebels. He goes to his father and he goes, give me my portion of the inheritance. And the father says, okay. And so he goes off and the scripture says he squandered his, all the money he had. He ends up, he's, take, he's slopping the hogs, he's hungry, he's about to starve to death. And the scripture says in verse 17, he comes to his senses. There was a change of heart that took place. And let me just tell you, in every one of us, salvation takes place when we come to our senses, when there is a change of viewing things from my perspective and beginning them to see them from God's perspective and what God has provided versus what I think I can provide to, quote, satisfy my soul. Because the bottom line is, it doesn't matter how much you have, what you do, you'll never be totally satisfied. You'll always have a desire for something else. But when God gets a hold of you and God fills you up, he fills you to overflowing. Jesus said, I came that you might have an abundant life, an overflowing life, something that the world can never compare to. And so he comes to his senses. He returns home to the Father. The story tells us the Father's been waiting. Guess what? Even in this room or within the sound of my voice, God is speaking to people. The Father is speaking. He is waiting on you. He's been waiting on you. And he's crying out, today is the day of salvation. Come to your senses. That which the world is offering is temporary, but what I have to offer you is eternal. And so... He comes to his senses. As he's coming home, I love this. The, the father just kind of, you can just see him sitting in one of those Cracker Barrel rocking chairs on the front porch. And he looks up and he notices. In fact, we were, my grandson was over at the house on Friday and Debbie was uh, looking at his legs. Now, let me set this in, in context, okay? We're, she, he has the bullock legs. I'm bow-legged. He's bow-legged. Michael John is not bow-legged. And so there's straight legs, and he's bow-legged. And Cade was going like, yeah, I think I got the bullock hair, too. And so they made me pull my pants up. Yeah, yeah, that's a bullock hair, all right. You know, and I'm like, what is the deal here, you know? But the father could see, even, that's my son. Nobody walks like that. I can tell as he's approaching. Was he bow-legged? I don't know. But anyway, he could identify him. And so he gets up and he runs to him. And the story says he welcomes him home. And the son doesn't go, man, you know, I need to come on back to you. and, and do my. He, go, he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven 
and against you, and he repents. He had it in right alignment. He didn't say, Father, I've sinned against you, and God. No. He realized his sin was ever before him. And so he's welcomed back, and the celebration begins. And so the celebration is going on. Well, that's where we pick up the story of the elder, the elder son. And I'll just say this note. Why is it that sometimes when someone who has messed up, I'll, I'll use this illustration, the marriage conference we did a couple of weeks ago, there was a young couple there, and this, this one young man, Clint, had been struggled with drugs and alcohol back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, most of his life for the last 10, 15 years. And Brian, the pastor there, he comes from that background, too. He was in my youth ministry, and I remember getting calls from his mom or dad. Brian's, Brian's in bed. He's, 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 like, you know, he's wanting to get right. Anyway, he struggled, and he would revert back and revert back. And Clint said this. He said, all of my former friends gave up on me and said, you'll never change. We're done with you. But he pointed to Brian, this young pastor, and he said, you never gave up. You prayed for me, you were available to me, you walked with me, even when I messed up over and over and over again. And I wonder why it is that sometimes even we in the church, someone repents, someone gets right with God, and we know their background, and the attitude is not, this is so awesome, man, God's going to do great things, but we have a tendency to go, well, we'll see. We'll see if it's really real. We'll see if it's legit or if he's just having one of his moments spiritually. Guys, that ought not to be. In fact, that's called judgment. You might want to go to Romans 2 verse 1 and memorize that verse. Because the scripture says in the way you judge someone, God says that's exactly the way I'm going to judge you. So when you think about that, and sometimes in the church we're the worst about that. You know, well, I know I've seen him go up and down and up and down. But what happens when the, that one time it's up and he never goes back down? Yeah. Yeah. Because this journey that he had on made no sense to us, but it made all the sense in the world to God because was bre- God was breaking him down and getting him more and more where he was open to say, Father, all I want is you. All I want is what we just sang about, Jesus enthroned upon my heart that's it anyway okay now let me get back on track here uh, we got to stay out of comparison mode we just do well here's the, the characteristics of this elder son and as I studied this passage I was telling Norm this week I've heard this passage preached every different way <laughs> it's, it's you know But the scripture starts out in this passage and it says there was a man who had two sons. Two sons. One was younger, one was older. Both of those sons had the opportunity to walk in relationship with the father or not. They just did. One, the younger one, he said, I want what I can have and I want to go. I'm out of here. I don't want to mess with you anymore. But finally, he got to a point where God said, all right, are you ready to come back? Yes, I am. Then you have this other son of the two sons, the older brother, and that's what we're going to zero in on this morning. And so I'm going to pose some questions to you. When you think about this passage of Scripture here, okay, we know the music is going on. The older brother shows up. I think it's interesting. He doesn't go ask his father, hey, dad, what's going on? He asks a servant. Now, if you're thinking about relationship, father, son, father, son, it's evident that this older brother who's been out working, he's been doing everything he's supposed to do, he's followed all of his alignments. And so many... uh, Theologians, preachers, whatever you want to call them, look at this and say, you know, this could mean 
uh, Jesus is referencing the Jewish culture versus the, the, the Gentile culture. The Gentiles were the prodigal son who came back. And here's the Jewish culture that, that saw him and were around him, heard him teach, but wouldn't have anything to do with him. But we know the scripture says he is addressing the issue of the heart of the Pharisees at this time. The ones who thought they had it all together. I'm so glad I'm not like those tax collectors. You know, tax collectors were hated, you know. I don't know about you. Somebody asked me the other day, do you like figuring your taxes every year? And I'm like, no, I don't. But you got to do it right now, okay? But you still, you do it. And the tax collectors were those, they cheated people. And they would, they would up the ante. If it was so much of this, they would tab on top of that. And so they were abusing their position. And they were viewed as the lost of the lost. And so Jesus is making a, a balanced picture here. Here's the prodigal son. And then here's the Pharisees. You guys are no better than the tax collectors. Because you don't get it. You hear what he's saying, but you don't get it. The elder brother, when he comes in, you can see he uses a terminology with his dad. He said the elder brother, older brother, became angry. He refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. Ma'am, are you, are you not glad that we have a loving father that will come after you? In fact, when he sent his son, that was him coming after you and me to say, I'm going to breach the broken relationship and provide the bridge through my son Jesus to reconnect us again. He was very tenacious. He was very focused on, here's the plan and I won't back away from it until it's accomplished. And when Jesus died on that cross, and the enemy sitting there going like, yeah, we won. And then all of a sudden, three days later, they go, hey, the tomb's empty. And the, and the uh, devil is going, uh-oh. Played right into the plan. Without the shedding of innocent blood, there could be no forgiveness of sin. And when Jesus died, he fulfilled his purpose, the Father's purpose, to bring us back in to relationship and fellowship with him. And so the Father goes out to the older son. They were celebrating. And he goes out and he's like, come on in. Man, this is awesome in here. And the older son is like, I ain't going to do it. I'm just not going to do it. I'm, I'm not going in. No. And he's very stubborn, very obnoxious in his, the whole attitude toward his father. And he uses this terminology. But he answered his father who pleaded with him, All these years I've been slaving for you. He used a word in the Greek that literally means he was the lower of the lower. You remember when the, the prodigal son came back and he was barefooted and he said, get him some sandals, get him a ring, get him a robe because the servants are the ones who went barefoot but not a son of the father. And so he put sandals on him and his whole mindset was to dig at his father. I've been slaving for you. You didn't care about me. I was like one of your hired hands. Which is not true. But he uses that word to come at the Father to get his point across of this is how I view you. You're nothing but a taskmaster. All these years, I've been slaving for you and never, ever disobeyed your orders. You know, the scripture talks about out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In fact, let me read that. In Luke chapter 6, Verse 45, it says, The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the abundance or the overflow of his heart, the mouth speaks. You squeeze something, what's inside of it is what comes out. I remember being at a youth conference years and years and years ago. And the guy had an orange and he was making a, it was basically an object lesson. He goes, you know, if I squeeze this orange, what's going to come out? And everybody goes, orange juice. But they had injected it with dye. 
And he squeezed it and he said, no, whatever's inside of it is what's going to come out. You would think, well, it's going to just have orange juice. No, because that something had been put in it that didn't belong there. And when it got squeezed, it came out. You ever been in a situation, especially, you know, maybe with friends or family, and they they finally just got on your last nerve? And you said, that's it, I've had it. And something happens, and you say something, and before you stop, the words are out. Man, they're done. They're, they're out there. And you're like, oh, man, I shouldn't have said that. Well, those words aren't coming back. But it's because you got squeezed, but what was inside is what came out. If it was the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, then that's what would have come out. But because of the flesh being in control, that's what comes out. And so in those moments, and we'll all have it. We'll have it today. There's going to be times when you're going to get squeezed today. And it may be around the person you love the most. I'll give you a great example. We're in our life group on Tuesday night, and we're going through boundaries. And, and so, you know, we're talking about, I uh, can't remember exactly what it was, but uh, something on control and everything. And so I share, you know, a little bit of what's in the book. And I look at Debbie like, you got anything to say? And she goes, uh... Yeah, like on Sunday afternoon. And I'm like, what? You know, and I'm thinking, I'm fixing to get thrust under the bus, and it's fixing to roll over me four or five times here. <laughs> and so, in a good way, it's not, wasn't in intentional for her. But she, I'm sitting there and I'm going, uh, oh yeah, that. And, and what we did, we just had some windows put in our house. And so we hadn't been able to water the grass, and she was in the backyard watering her plants, and she said, you know, you probably need to water the grass. It hadn't been watered in three days. Now, I know she said she didn't say it that way, but that's the way I interpret it. Isn't it amazing, guys, how we filter things, and it's totally the way we see it, but maybe it wasn't the way it was said. And so I go, I'm thinking, well, we, we couldn't get the grass wet. The guys have been all over the yard. She goes, well, I mean, you know, if you want your grass to die, and I know that's not the way she said it, but, you know, anyway. So I turn and I go, I'm going to go turn the sprinklers on so you'll stop your whining and complaining. And as soon as I said that, I was like, I shouldn't have said that. <sighs> but let me just tell you, in the moment, what was inside of me is what came out. And so guess what I get to do then? I get to go back and ask forgiveness and repent of my attitude and all of that honey you know I love you I didn't you know but here's the deal the words went out and when you think about this this elder son his words were already spewing out what he felt inside toward his father and toward his brother that he wouldn't even call his brother he called him your other son Wow, man, there's some, there's some breakdown going on in, in, that, in the family issue there. Well, and so when we get squeezed, you, you, you see what comes out of us. And so I ask you this question. Do you serve the Lord out of reverence and love or out of fear and obligation? I mean, why do we serve God? Well, he's going to get me. For years, I tithed because the belief I had was if I don't tithe, something bad's going to happen to me. And praise God, God changed that and allowed me to realize, no, I get to give to the Father. And here's the deal. He loves me. His goal and desire is not to hurt or harm me. But for years, that's what I, I just did. You know, the, the mindset was, you know, well, you don't give. God will get it some way or another, and you may not like it. Well, he's a good father. He loves us, and he has the best in store for us. But oftentimes, we serve out of obligation. Well, they've asked me to serve. If I don't, they're going to look down on me. No, just tell them, hey, I can't do it. All you have to do is say, no, thank you, in that setting, instead of dragging it out 
and developing drama with the whole thing. And so, do you serve him out of reverence and love? Is your walk with God more of a, I have to do this, or God, you're amazing, and I get to meet with you, and I get to pray that I'll never get over the fact that you love me so much and provided for me the gift of salvation. That's where we want to find ourselves. And this older, elder brother, man, he is so estranged from the Father. But guess what? He has lived with the Father all of his life in that he has been right there in the house. Let me just tell you, there are people that come to God's house, the church, every single Sunday. And they, all they are is in the same house where God is present, but they have no connection with the Father. Because they're choosing to live their own life the way they want to, rather than be surrendered to the Father. Repent and say, God, I just want to take you all in, and I want you to have control. Because they come to their senses, their spiritual senses. Serving on the exterior. Serving with no heart. So the question is, how long had the elder son felt like this? I don't believe it had just happened once the younger son took off. Now he used that as a point of reference. Now you bring him back, he comes back, and you do all this celebration. And all of a sudden, you know, he's thinking, well, wait a minute. You've never even given me a goat. So I can celebrate. And you see in that one verse, I, me, my, I. It's all about him. When really it should be all about the Father. And the Father's love. Because what does the Father end up saying in that parable? He says, you know what? You've always been with me. It's all yours. Do you realize what God desires to lavishly pour out upon his sons and daughters. And it's ours for the asking. Now, it doesn't mean he's a puppet on a string and I can pray. The scripture says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask whatever you wish and it will be done. It doesn't say, now, if you abide in me, kind of hang out and go to church with me, man, you can just ask whatever. And I'll, I'll, <laughs> boom, I'm like a genie in a bottle. Poof, there it'll be. No. If you abide in me, in him, spending time with him, walking with him, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak into you, taking the truth of God's word and saying, this is how this is lived out in you. And just abide in me. One uh, translation says, if you remain in me, if you just stick with me and walk with me, whatever you, whatever you pray for. I'm going to answer. I'm going to do. Why? Because you're not praying out of a selfish motive. Because you're in me. You're remaining in me and you're walking with me. Therefore, I know your heart is in tune with my heart. And God says, I want to give you my heart. My heart's desire is for you to experience all the blessings that I have in store for you. And so this wasn't just a happenstance. Why do you think he had never come to the Father and been transparent with him and been honest with him? I mean, he'd worked for him all his life. He'd had the opportunities. Evidently, and I'm not trying to preach something into the Word, but evidently there was a view of the Father that this elder son had that was... That was blinding him from seeing the goodness and the love and the, the desire that the father really had for him. And he was content to walk this path. And I'm going to go do my work. I'm going to do this. He was the elder brother. He was going to get the most of the inheritance. It was all the rest. Now that the young son had taken that and squandered it, it was gone. It was done. Now he was going to have it on. And I can't help but think, I wonder if the older brother was thinking, I bet you you're going to divvy up some of my part and give it to him, even though he squandered all the rest of it away. Scripture doesn't say that. But it's amazing what our minds will begin to think. And that just shows the stinginess and the jealousy that can take place in different settings. That goes on in our life when we are not remaining in him. Do you think the father was blindsided by this attitude? 
Do you think God is blindsided when you're struggling with something and you finally get honest and real and transparent with him? He says, Lord, I need your help. This area of my life. And he goes, I know. I've, I've been waiting for you to say something. I knew it was going on. But I needed you to come to a realization of your senses and step in and allow me to begin to work with freedom. But no, you've been over here. and It's kind of like the person who says, boy, I don't know what I'll do if this happens. I, I don't know how, how, how God could work or do it. God can do anything. He's the creator of the universe. He's everywhere. He knows everything. If you have an issue being transparent and honest, praying to the Father then you have an issue of understanding who he is. He knows it all. So just get over it and sit down with him and say, Father, I know you already know what's going on in my heart, but here's, I just need to verbalize it. I need to get it out of me and allow you then to begin to give your Holy Spirit the ability to bring salve into my life and bring healing into my life and bring wisdom and direction through your word into my life. You never even gave me a goat. Fatted calf. Man, this is the special calf. And he's over here and he's going, all I wanted was a little, (laughs) you know. Oh, my gosh. No, I want the big thing. I want what's best. You never even gave me a little bitty goat. He never asked. The scripture says he never asked. And and you want to go, no. All you had to do was ask. I love what James says in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you can't have what you want. You quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you don't ask God. When you do ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. The whole attitude of the elder brother was like, man, you didn't, even, you didn't ever. Why didn't you ask me? What is it that God is waiting? Now, here's the thing. He already knows. But what is he waiting to hear you ask him for? What is it that there's this deepest need, this peace that you need this, uh, this sense of, of knowing that you are secure in him. We had the opportunity to share with the guy at that retreat that he'd gone through years of, I don't know that I'm saved, I don't know that I'm saved, and we had the privilege of walking with him and challenging him. Just get before the Father and take his word and listen to him. And when he did, he said, I got on my knees and said, Jesus, I need you, save me. And he gave his life to Christ. Well, that's not, well, well, I hope he hangs in with it. No, that solidified that for him. He just hadn't asked. Well, this is one of those unique stories because Jesus doesn't end this parable. We don't know what the elder son really did. Because when you read it, The last two verses, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and we had to be glad because this brother of yours was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. And there's no verse 33 through 35 that says, and the father says, I want you to be alive too or anything. That's how the story ends. Because the story ends with the intentionality of this is the word of God. I've given you these two scenarios. How does it apply to you? Do you fit in the area of the prodigal son who came to his senses and came back? Or are you one who has walked in religiosity and you have done all the right things, but you've never entered into a true relationship where you could go to the Father and say, Father, I'm hurting. 
Father, I need. No, I'm just going to do the things. I'm just going to come to church. I'm just going to serve in the church, and that'll get me. You cannot earn your way into heaven, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy and his love, he has saved us. And so it's not by what we've done. No, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For the wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift of God that's freely given. And so the Father responds, everything that I have, it's yours. It's yours. A question for you. Whose eyes are you viewing life with? Yours or the Father's? Yours or the Father's? There's a story over in Second Kings chapter 6 about Elisha and his servant. And the Arameans are about to come down on Elisha. They are ticked off. He never gives them the words that they want. And finally the king says, go surround him. I want him mm, taken care of. And so his servant comes out and he looks up on the hills all around and he goes, uh-oh, there's a bunch of warriors out there. And this is what Elisha says in verses 16 and 17 of 2 Kings chapter 6. I love this. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. He opened his eyes. God is desiring to open our eyes. And it may be that you said yes to Jesus, and you've been walking with him, and God is saying, but I have more for you. I want you to grow and go deeper and be rooted in me, building on the foundation of Jesus Christ with the gold, silver, and precious stones. Or it may be that your eyes have been focused on stuff, the things of the church. Let me just tell you, when we get to heaven, when we stand before God, it will not be a gathering of the church at Benbrook. It will be a gathering of one-on-one. -on -one. The judgment seat of Christ, the scripture talks about, for every son or daughter of the king. And we will stand and we will give an account of what we did with Jesus on this earth. In the short, brief time, oh, well, I've got 50 or 60 more years. Whew, James says, it's like a mist and it's here and it's gone. And if you think, I'll put it off, I'll put it off, I'll do, I'm going to, I'm going to. No, today is the day to begin to grow and begin to press in. And let me just tell you, if you're not in that setting where you know for certain that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, I'm telling you, you don't want to go to the other judgment area. The scripture talks about the great white throne judgment, which will be for those who didn't know him. And that's not a fear tactic. That's not to scare you. That's a reality tactic. That's in the word of God. But God says, wait, 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 wait. Son, it's all yours. You've always been with me. And so here were the Jews. They knew the scriptures. They walked. They studied the scriptures. And the living word of God was right next to them. And they were blind to it. Are you blind? Or are you beginning to realize, wait a minute. There's more to this thing than just knowing about him. I want to walk with him and him to walk with with me and in me and the Holy Spirit to be in control of me. Jesus doesn't close the parable and it's intentional because he, he finishes it right then and he walks away and he steps away knowing that this group of people and this group of people, the tax collectors and the sinners, they know who they connect with, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious people, they know exactly where he they, who they connect with. But here's the bottom line. Even though they might be over here, Jesus is saying, I want you over here. Come on. Let's take that knowledge and now let's put it, feet to it 
and let you be living and active with the word of God so that the tax collectors and the sinners are drawn to you not because of what you know but because of who you know and who you walk in great word great word he leaves it to the listener the repentant son or the Pharisee who goes through the religious motions and serves out of obligation, not thanksgiving, for what God has done for them, it's, it's either or. It's not, well, I want to do this. No, there's no dabbling back and forth. There's not any more time for that. Folks, we got to get serious. In fact, the more I study the Scripture, the more I find myself going, God, you're going to hold the church accountable. We have watered down the gospel. We have promoted an easy believism. Just say yes to Jesus and then go on and live your life the way you want to. No, it's called denial and crucifying the flesh and walking with him, surrendered and yielded totally to him, not to, well, I'll do a little of this, and then I'll go over here and do some of this and do some of that. That ain't going to wash. And it's time. Let's be the church that lives out what we say we believe. Let's not be the church that believes something, but we choose to live the way we want to. We ought to live the way he wants us to. Guys, and to me, that's awesome. We get that privilege to do that. We don't have to. We get to. And he says, and I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to walk with you, and I'll never leave you or forsake you. And when you get burdened and laden down, I'm going to come right up next to you, and I'm going to carry your load for you. Wow. What a Savior. What a loving Father. Let's pray. Father, my prayer would be that wherever, whatever, we need to do as sons and daughters of the king that we would be obedient to do that and so father this is the invitation just as jesus left that parable open my challenge to the listeners here would be all right lord what do you want to do with this what do you want to do with me and in me and through me And when he speaks, just obey. Just take the step. Quit fighting it. Surrender and watch him move and watch him work. I'm amazed more and more of how we have allowed the world to direct what we think discipleship and surrender and 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 following Christ looks like folks we need to get back to the Word of God the Word of God says if any man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back that's compromise he's not fit for the kingdom of God Wow strong words but awesome words that says, just start plowing with him and keep your eyes on him. You don't want to look back because what's ahead of you is better than what's behind you. And so, God, I would just pray that as we head out of here this morning, that we would just take to heart that passage of Scripture. God, let us live in those verses 11 through 32. For the next several days and just keep asking the question father I want to make sure that I'm walking with you and I'm surrendered to you and if there's anything that's causing me to feel like I've got to be a slave to you I have to do this no I no longer want to function in that way I want to be walking where I, I my response is God I thank you that I get to do this I get to do life with you I get to walk with you and do ministry with you I don't have to go do something and say, God, can you get over here now and bless this? No, we're going to walk this path together. And so, Lord, I pray that you would walk with us from this place. And that, God, as we go out these doors in a few moments, that we would realize there is where people need to see the difference. This is a safe haven, no doubt about it. But out there, the enemy is out to steal, kill, and destroy. And we're called to go and plant seeds and love people and call them out of the world into relationship with you. And so that's the simplicity of the gospel. 
Let us go. Let us walk. Let us walk in your power and your anointing, not ours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.